A very good morning to each and every one of you. Surely, surely, this is the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning to the United Presbyterian Church in Patterson, Emmanuel Presbyterian Church in Indianapolis, and to all of our friends and families, wherever you are. Very good morning to each and every one of you. As we continue with our live streaming through Zoom on this fifth Sunday after Pentecost. So with that, would you join me in a call to worship taken from Psalms 42 and 43? As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. Go oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me to the throne of your grace. Hope in God, for I shall again praise the Lord, my help and my God. Then I will go to the altar and praise you with the heart, O Lord, my God. Let us worship God as we continue with our prayer of praise and adoration together. O God of light and truth, lead us by your word to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then we shall come to your altar with exceeding joy and praise you with delight. For you are God. The wind cannot contain you, nor the fires consume you. The earthquake fails to encompass your power, for you are God. Speak as you have spoken with your still small voice, and we shall hear and be your people. Our opening hymn is Be Thou My Vision, taken from the book of hymns number 339. Be Thou My Vision. <laughs> We will now continue with our litany of confession and pardon responsibly. Holy God, you have given us the freedom to choose your way. You have told us what is good. Your law has revealed the difference between right and wrong. And yet we confess that too often we fail to do what is good and right. 
We do not say what needs to be said. We do not dare do what needs to be done. Forgive us, be brave, and in your abundance, recall us to your ways. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We believe in the promise of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. During our announcements at this time, I would just like to remind all the deacons and the elders, if perhaps they can come and check their mailboxes, maybe once a week or so, just to make sure that you know, you've seen all the information that is in your mailbox that you can review. And the other important announcement is that um, I just wanted to let you know that um, we will be in church here next week for a service, um, as well as, you know, you can join us on remote. Another important announcement is um, I'd like, just like to remind everyone, I hope by now, most of you, if not all of you, would have received an invite for Pastor Tate's retirement celebration. Now, if you have not, you can please call the office or call one of your elders or your deacons, wherever you feel comfortable. Just call to make sure that if you haven't received and you want to receive an invite and you, you want some more information, because the, the celebration is on the 31st of this month. And there is a sort of a cutoff date where we have to present certain numbers to the facility to, you know, to know how, much, how, many, how many people are coming. So please call the office if you haven't received an invite as yet, whether by mail, regular mail that is, or email, okay? And those um, respective committees, I guess you, you know when it's your day for your meetings. With that, we will now go to our scripture lessons. Couple of now. Oh, oh, Mr. Mr. James Young would like to um, make some announcements. Yeah, before we go to the scripture, there are a couple of things. One, I want to rely on my legal training to say that one of the things that we often say in, in court, because in court, we have to have a clear record and know exactly what happened. And one expression that we say is for purposes of clarity of the record, and then we make a statement. What I want to say that for purposes of clarity of the record this morning, our soloist is our friend and our brother, James Plum. And we have been moved, and we thank him for his willingness to come and share his gift with us. The second announcement, as you recall, a few weeks ago, we went out and we had the the, the golf tournament over at, at Valley Brook. And each year, the golf, the purpose of the tournament is to raise funds. 
Well, this year, friends, it is my pleasure to announce that the profit, not the gross, not the receipts, but the profit from this year's tournament was over $10,000. And we urge all of you to be ready to come out again next year. But of that $10,000, two things. One, $5,000 will go to the program that we've selected at Teaneck High School to be a beneficiary of our, our, our benevolence here in our, our tournament. The second one, and, and we announced at the tournament, that he, Pastor Tate has been with us so long and her service has been so outstanding that we decided that her retirement will not just be an event, but rather a season. And what the committee has decided, that because of her giving spirit, we have initiated the Gloria Tate Scholarship Fund. And each year, each year, some deserving young people will have an opportunity to enhance their education from receiving funds from the Gloria Tate Scholarship Fund. And so I'm happy to announce that the initial input to the fund, is, again, is over $5,000 from the golf tournament. Amen. Now, all of you, all of you will have an opportunity to continue to contribute to the scholarship fund, but each and every year for eternity, some deserving young people will have an opportunity to continue their education based on receiving scholarships from the Reverend Dr. Gloria Jean Tate Scholarship Fund. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen. So, deserving of, so deserving of that for the Glory J. Tate Foundation for the scholarship fund. So with that, we'll begin with our um, scripture lessons. Begin, I will begin with the book of Mark, the second chapter, verses 1 through 12. Let's hear the word of the Lord. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room for them, not even about the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning their hearts. Why does this man speak thus? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question thus in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, forgiven or to say, Arise? Take up your pallet and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take up your pallet and go home. And he rose and immediately took up the pallet and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. I will continue. With the book, the first, first Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. For consider your call, brethren. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, 
so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is a source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness, and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast of the Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. And Heather, you know, here at the at the Teaneck Church, we don't do much shout. <laughs> but sometimes we have to call on all our Christian strength to keep our seats as we did this morning. Thank you so much, brother and Heather. That was just wonderful. Order my steps, look. 
Good morning, church. Good morning. Indeed, what we are having this morning is a holy good morning, church. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. And our loving God has invited us to come to his house to gather in his name to worship him. From our study of his word, we know that Jesus promised that when two or three gather in his name, he will be there in the midst of them. We thank him and praise him for his presence here this morning. Our Bible tells us that the Lord works in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. Let's look at the world in which we live today. Things are so upside down that we don't know what is normal anymore. We have kids buying machine guns, shooting up churches, schools, uh, stores, and, and, and peaceful protests. The other day, we had a young man who took it upon himself to climb up on the roof with an AK-47 machine gun and raid down bullets, killing innocent people damaging, injuring several others, and putting a permanent psychological pain on a community as they gathered for one of America's finest celebrations, the 4th of July Parade. Some of those seeking to lead us would seem to would justify that young fellow's right or the right of those folks to, to carry those kinds of weapons. And when you listen to that, you think that some of our leaders are better suited to be fitted with big red noses and long, funny shoes, second in little cars, and working for Ringling Brothers, more so than having a seat in the United States Congress. Our Supreme Court has told us that the freedom of a 13-year-old girl and her civil rights are unduly burdened by asking that little girl to wear a mask in school during the worst pandemic in 100 years in the history of our nation. While that same Supreme Court says, heaven forbid, should that little girl get pregnant, is not an infringement on her civil rights. It's not an infringement on her freedom to force that little girl to continue that pregnancy and have that baby and to become a mother at age 13. At age 13. For almost three years, COVID-19 has shut down our schools and shut down our churches, businesses, and governmental functions. <clears throat> Some churches have been closed for over two years. They haven't had any services at all. But that's not the case at the Teaneck Church. Because here at Teaneck, under the leadership of our pastor, Reverend Dr. Gloria Jean Tate, and with the ingenuity of our crack technological team, Mel and Audrey England, Garth and Jeremy Robinson, and Ed Chang Soon, we've been able to have the doors of the church remain open. And not only have we continued to praise the Lord at the Teaneck Church, we've been able to reach out to our brothers and sisters at the United Church in Patterson, at the Emmanuel Church in Indianapolis, Indiana, and to our brothers and sisters, some of whom have moved away to different locations, but still have a warm place in their heart for the Teaneck Church to join us in worship each and every Sunday morning. Many of them are enjoying, are here and have joined with us today. And our service goes on at the Teaneck Church. So that's what I mean when I say we have a holy good morning church. So again, Teaneck, good morning, good morning, Teaneck. The story is told about a young fella who called his mother one Saturday afternoon, and mom had caller ID on her phone. And so she could tell who it was. And you know how some of these things are. She was glad to, to hear from him, but you could tell that she had some little thing going on. So she picked up, she said, hello. And he said, mom, how you doing? 
Mom said, I'm not doing so well. He said, why not, Mom? She said, because I haven't had anything to eat for 33 days. He said, 33 days? Mom, you can't live like that. Have you seen a doctor to find out what's wrong? She said, I don't need a doctor. I know what's wrong. The last time my only son called me, I had a mouthful of food. And I was determined that that would never happen again. And so I have not eaten anything over the past few days waiting for my only son to find it in his heart to call me once again. So I mentioned to you this morning, friends, if, if your mom is still living, call her, talk to her, be with her. If God has called your mom to her heavenly rest, that doesn't stop you from calling out to her. I know I speak to my mom almost every day. So let it be done. For many of us, English is our native language. And as such, we're familiar with a number of slang expressions and, and regional idioms. And for others, English is a second language. And those folks tell us that English is a difficult language because many times in English, the same word can have different meanings depending on the context. For example, in our story this morning, a call may be made with a telephone. You either receive or make a call. Each of us do that each and every day, sometimes many times during the day. But if you attend an athletic event, you sometimes you'll see someone calling the balls and strikes. You may see someone throwing yellow flags on the ground, calling penalties. You may see someone with a whistle in his mouth, pointing at people, calling fouls. You may see someone in little short pants with a red card and a yellow card calling violations. All of those are calls. So that's the, some of the difference or some of the ways that calling are, are made in our language. In our language, we also say that when someone enters the ministry, we say that he or she was called. We say that sometimes if someone has a particular skill, that that is their calling. Your calling may be to teach little children. You may have a calling to sing songs or play an instrument or both, and thereby lift the spirits of all who are blessed to hear. You may take pictures. Sometimes you wax floors. You may wash cars. All of us have a skill and a calling. And as Christians, our duty is to use that calling in betterment and in fulfillment of God's will. Many of us are fans of the National Football League. Here at the church, we have Giant fans. We have Jet fans. We have have fans of the Dallas Cowboys, the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Washington Commanders, the Las Vegas Raiders. And we have at least one. I know. I hope Edna's on the line this morning because we have at least one fan of the Carolina Panthers. That's our own Edna Anderson, whose grandson, Robbie, who has been here at the church many times, is now a wide receiver with the Carolina Panthers. And all of us wish him well unless he's playing against our team. <laughs> Other than that, we wish Robbie well as he fulfills his call. Uh, at this time of year, all of the football fans are very excited. Teams are about to go into training camp. Every team has the exact same record. No wins and no losses. Every team's thinking that perhaps this is going to be our year. A few weeks ago, we saw the NFL draft, and the draft is the process by which teams select new players. And if you ever see that draft on TV, I mean, it's amazing. Some folks treat it like a game day. 
They get all dressed up in jerseys and regalia. Some of them paint their faces. They gather in places with food and drink, and they burst into raucous cheers as the selections are made if they approve of the selection, and sometimes they boo if they don't approve of the selection. Well, my friends, it is now 2022. Modern times, they call this. And I'm asking you to join me this morning to think outside of the box. I'm asking you to think outside of the box. Now, here we go. Because our brothers and sisters who have English as a second language are saying, Jim, I don't have a box. What box are you speaking of? What do you mean? But we understand that when you say you're thinking outside of the box, it means to look at things a little differently, to come at things with a different perspective. They say that folks who write music or write books or write plays think outside of the box because that helps them to be creative. That helps them to be creative. This morning, we're going to look at another type of call. And I'm asking you to think outside of the box. We're going to look at the start of Jesus's ministry at the beginning of his time, as his calling of the initial 12 disciples. There are those that would say that some of those choices weren't that good. There were those that would, would claim that there's some issues with Jesus's calls, and we're going to look at those this morning. But point out, I want to point out to you, brothers and sisters, there are three things that we can learn from Jesus's early ministry. The first thing is that Jesus calls people who would seem or might seem unqualified. His first 12, he called farmers, he called fishermen. One day they, they saw Jesus approaching the temple and he walked into the temple and a guy named Levi, who was the tax collector, was sitting at the table in the temple. And some of the, the Pharisees and the, the highfalutin type people looked at him and said, oh, he going to get it now. Jesus is going to tell him now. Jesus walked up to Levi and said, follow me. And Levi put down everything and followed Jesus. They went to Levi's house and some of the Pharisees saw Jesus sitting with the, with the, with the tax collectors and with the sinners eating and drinking. Now, just so you be clear, back in ancient Egypt, Israel, the Romans had, had invaded Israel and were occupying Israel. And each province was ruled over or had a tax collector. And the tax collector had to send money to Rome every month. And there was a certain amount of money that he had that they had to send. And anything that they collected over that, the tax collector could keep. And they had the Roman army there to enforce that collection. So as such, tax collectors were hated people. They didn't like the people of, of Israel hated the tax collector. They couldn't see how can Jesus, he, he's our savior, how can he be sitting with those sinners? And when Jesus heard of the people complaining about him sitting with, with, the, with the sinners, he said that you don't go to the doctor when you're well. I didn't come here to serve the righteous. I came here to save sinners. Sometimes we look and, and the Pharisees are the ones that, that complained and they, had, they were kind of highfalutin. We even have some Christians, certainly not at our church, but at some church. There's some Christians who walk around with their noses so high up in the air that on rainy days they're in danger of drowning, but that's our issue. We look at it. But Levi, if you studied the Bible and you, you stood, Levi... When he, we said he left everything, he didn't leave quite everything. He took his pen with him because Levi became Matthew. And Matthew wrote the gospel 
that many think is the greatest account of all of the life of Jesus Christ. And Jesus found him in the temple. He called a guy named Simon. Now, Simon was a zealot. Now, today we would call zealots uh, terrorists because Simon was a, a, a devout Israeli citizen, and these group of terrorists would, would just cause problems for the Romans everywhere. They, they held marches, they protested, they had problems, and, and they were a, a pain in the, and, and I'll let you fill in the blank <laughs> as to where that pain was uh, for, for the Romans, but, but Simon was, was, was a pain, and Jesus called him. To, to be one of his 12 disciples. And if we study our Bibles, we learn that Simon went on to become Peter. And Jesus said that you are a rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. And so Simon and, 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 and Levi were, were among the two of the initial 12. Also, he, he called Judas. Now, Judas turned out to be a wolf in sheep's clothing. And I'll let you decide what was the value of, of that qualification, of that calling. Now, on paper, it wouldn't seem that Simon and Levi were qualified to be disciples. But that's the lesson from Jesus' ministry. Jesus doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. Let me say that to you one more time. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. And so remember we, how he said, we said um, during, that, during the NFL draft, folks either cheered or booed after each pick. Think about how you live your life. Think about how folks look at you. How do you think folks would act if Jesus called your name? as a draft or one of his first choices. For example, if we were sitting in a church and Jesus said, with his first pick, Jesus choose Melvin England. Boy, folks would break out cheering and, and be so happy and hear from it. Or Jesus, uh, if Jesus would, with his second pick, Jesus called Ruth White. Again, folks would be cheering and, and be so happy. Wonderful examples of children of God. His third pick is that Jesus calls Donald Trump. I'll let you decide how the crowd would react to that choice. Sometimes in our human weakness, we may feel that, that we are not qualified to be disciples of Jesus Christ. But our Bible tells us that God has given each of us a gift a set of tools to be used in his service. And he's ready to help you learn how to use those tools. Unlike the NFL draft, Jesus has unlimited picks and unlimited time to choose because he is still calling. Jesus is still calling. Many of us were called as little children. As our mom and dad took us to church or Sunday school, Others were called later in life. Some of you, either here in the church or out there in the internet, may be called this morning, but Jesus is still calling you to come and serve. Still calling you to come and serve. Now, let me see what we, what we have here with us this morning and what we have out there on the internet. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or, uh, or stand up and, and testify, but just say in, in your mind, how many of you were on the dean's list when you were in school? How many of you were in the honor society? How many of you graduated with honors? How many of you were athletes? And as athletes, you were either all league or all county or all state or even all American. Any of you are listed in who's who or voted in your school that you are most likely to succeed? Well, if that's true of any of those things for you, then you're what we call an overachiever, an overachiever. Now, I have good news for you that Jesus can still use you. He can still use you. 
but he may have to cool you out just a little bit. Because as Ed said this morning, God calls the ordinary people. So if you're one of those overachievers, he may have to humble you out just a little bit. But he's calling, calling your name. Even after the first 12 choices, Jesus continued his call. And, and we know the story, it's the story of, of Saul on the road to Damascus. Now, if you are a Bible student and you've studied your Bible, you know that when Saul was on the road to Damascus, he wasn't out for a Sunday drive with his family. No, Saul was going to Damascus because the, the Romans had sent him over there to Damascus because he heard that there was people over there trying to take up the mantle of Jesus Christ, trying to form a church. And he wanted Jesus, Saul to go over there and put a stop to that. And on the road to Damascus, a bolt of lightning came down, hit Saul, knocked him to the ground. And the voice from heaven said, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute me? And all of us know that Saul went on to become Paul, perhaps one of the greatest, if not the greatest, of all the apostles of all the apostles. And you notice that in the case of Levi, Simon, and Paul, and Saul, that they changed their names after they answered the call to God. Well, friends, I say to you this morning, God's not asking you to change your name. You can go on and be whoever you want, but he is calling on you to follow him and to be a friend to him. Uh, even other examples of, of, of calling to God. I read a story just the other day about a guy who was a, a football coach. And he was a, a football coach and, and a teacher and a devout Christian. And some of the boys on the football team were a little bit on, the, for want of a better term, on the hoodlum side. I mean, they got in trouble and caused problems. And he took his boys off to, out to the mountains to, 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 to have a camp that he hoped he could turn them around. And at the camp, he, he taught football skills. He taught life skills. And he also tried to introduce them to a life with Jesus Christ. And on the last night of the camp, he had what you call an altar call. And he had the fellas, he, he said, anybody who's going to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, come on down front and profess. Them. And one young guy, and this guy was probably the, one of the biggest troublemakers in the camp, came down to the front with tears in his eyes and said that he's decided to follow Jesus. And the coach asked him, well, well what made you decide that? And he said, well, coach, it was the night that, that Reggie White spoke. Now, those of you that are football fans, you know that Reggie White was perhaps one of the greatest defensive linemen in the history of the National Football League. And the coach said, wow, Reggie made that impression on you? And the coach said, no, coach, it wasn't Reggie. It was the young guy who spoke just before him. This was a young guy in a wheelchair paralyzed from the waist down because he had been in a terrible accident. But that young guy came to the microphone in the wheelchair, praising God. He thanked God for all he had done. He thanked God for sparing his life. He thanked God for bringing him safely to the beginning of that day. Now, this young guy was maybe 18, 19, 20 years old. He's going to live many years. All of those years were going to be spent in that wheelchair because he would never walk again. But in spite of all his adversity, in spite of all his problems, he was still praising the Lord. And so the young football player said, Coach, if with all of his problems, and all of his dilemma, if he knows a God, that he's willing to stand by and pray to and praise, then that's a God that I need to know. And that young fella also became a devout Christian. One other story I'll tell you real quick was a, a story about a, a, a battle during World War II. 
several uh, soldiers uh, were stationed on a little island in the Pacific. And one day the, the, the commander called the company down. He said, brothers, the, the Japanese know that we're here. The Japanese have decided that they need this island for their communication efforts. And our intelligence tells us that they're going to come tonight to try to take it. And so what I'm telling you fellas to do, I want you to dig your foxholes, pile your sandbags, and be ready. Because tonight is going to be a very, very rough night. So all the brothers, well, most of the brothers start digging and preparing for this, for the upcoming situation. There's one guy, he was kind of a happy-go-lucky type of guy. He didn't worry about anything. He had no problems. One of his favorite expressions was, don't worry, whenever things would come up. So he decided that he was not going to dig a foxhole. He going to just get behind a tree because he figured he'd be safe. Well, when darkness fell over the island, and sure enough, the Japanese hit the beach, and the Japanese opened fire with machine gun, da -da 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 -da, with rockets, rockets shooting here and there all over. The Americans returned fire, machine guns and rockets, bam, bam. Limbs are falling off the trees. You could hear people shouting out in agony because folks had been shot. The battle raged for maybe a half hour or so. And at the end of that time, uh, it, 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 it was quiet again. And an eerie quiet came over the island. And it, the sun had not come up yet, but you could see the smoke and, and haze from all of the gunfire. And, oh, and during that eerie quiet, you could hear a voice coming from up behind that tree. Now, here at the Teaneck Church, sometimes we sing a song says, there's a bomb in Gilead. And there's a, a verse in that song that says, if, if you can't pray like Peter, or if you can't pray like Paul. But if you could have heard that brother up there behind the tree, you would think that Peter and Paul were up there in the hole with him. And he was saying, Lord, I accept you. Lord, you are all powerful. Lord, just help me, Lord. Lord, I know I haven't been that good. I, Lord, I know I haven't lived according to your will. But if you just help me, Lord. Now, sometimes you would think that that brother had attended the TNA church because he had a call to worship. He had a prayer of confession. He had a prayer of praise and adoration. And he was there waiting for his assurance of pardon. And sure enough, he said, Lord, if you bring me through this night, I promise that I will follow you and live according to your will. Well, as the sun came up and the smoke cleared away, seems that all the Japanese had gone and the brothers had maintained and kept the island. Well, suffice it to say that the brother came down from behind that tree and he became a disciple of God. He stopped drinking. He stopped shooting crap with the brothers. In fact, he gave up two or three other vices, the nature of which we can't talk about here in the Teaneck Church this morning. But suffice it to say that he went on to become an evangelist, a disciple of God. Now, one of the things we have to be careful of, friends, that sometimes as Christians, we, we, we realize that all that we have, all that we are, and all that we become is a gift from a loving God. And sometimes we try to take the credit for things that God has done. So I don't want you to be like the little woodpecker that I heard about who landed on the side of one of them giant oak trees and little woodpecker start tapping, tap, 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 tap. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. All of a sudden, a bolt of lightning came down. Bam, split that tree in half. The woodpecker fell to the ground on the side, stood up and dusted himself off and looked to his brothers on the side who were over there laughing, said, did you see what I just did? <laughs> uh, don't try to take credit for things that God has done. Our second lesson, friends, is that a Christian life 
is meant to be a joyous life. God wants us to be joyful, and he loved ordinary people. When someone decides to follow Jesus, it's an occasion to celebrate. Some folks think that the Christian life is a solemn, somber, uh, straight-laced life, something that is, is more to be endured rather than enjoyed. But Jesus taught that the Christian life should be happy and joyous. Remember, he said that I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. The Christian life should be like a feast, not like a funeral. Jesus said there's rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents and follows the law. When you read the Gospels, you see that Jesus was more comfortable among a group of misfits, misfits than he was with a group of religious snobs. The Pharisees who we talked about earlier were they criticized John the Baptist because he was so disciplined and abstinent. And then they turned around and criticized Jesus because he was the opposite. Some say that if Jesus was to appear on earth for one day, that he wouldn't show up at a mega church or a crystal cathedral. No, he, if he was to come back for one day, he's more likely to go to a drug den or some hangout joint. And you say, why? And why is because the folks in the church, they know Jesus. They love Jesus. But Jesus is the shepherd, the shepherd who was willing to leave the 99 and go in search of the one who's in need of him and is lost and in danger. In her book, the, I read a story about a, a gospel book called Gospel Medicine written by an author named Barbara Taylor. She wrote on that same subject. She said that if, if Jesus was putting together a, a sinner's table at a local restaurant and at his table, he might have a child molester. He might have a crack at it. He might have a motorbiker. He might have a hooker. He might have a thief. And at the head of that table, Jesus himself would be seated. And at the next table, there'd be you with a group of Proper Christians, well-dressed. They've joined hands, prayed, and are quietly discussing the things of God. But the noise at the sinner's table is so great that some of them get up and leave. And when they get up and leave, you notice that there's an empty seat at the sinner's table. And the guy at the end of the sinner's table with the beard looks at you and pushes out that empty chair and said, would you care to join us? What would you do, friends? What would you do? Some people say, of course, if I knew that it was Jesus, I'd join the table, I'd join. But what would you do if you didn't know that it was Jesus? Jesus said that as much as you do unto one of these, the least of my brethren, you do so unto me. One of the least of these, my brethren, you do so unto me. Jesus loved those type of people. He drank with them and, and he ate with them. And if we are going to be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must be willing to be more like Jesus than like religious snobs, even in the way that our Savior died. I mean, he didn't die in a crystal cathedral on a marble altar between two gold candlesticks. No, our Lord died on a garbage heap, on a cross of wood between two thieves. And even out with his last breath, he was ministering to one of those thieves, telling him that you will be with me in my father's house. Amen. We're still ministering right up to the end. Finally, our last message this morning, friends, is that Jesus challenges the self-righteous. He said that he came to earth for the same reason that a doctor spent time in the hospital, because that's where the sick people are. He came to help sinners. Now, there's a disease that's, wor that's worse than anything known in modern medicine. It's a spiritual disease called sin. And if we don't get it cured, we don't just die, 
we die eternally. Jesus was full of love and grace in most of the things he said, but he again, he targeted and pointed out the shortcomings of those Pharisees, folks who were more concerned with outward goodness than they are with inner righteousness. And you look at some of our leaders today and some of these rallies around the country and folks are are invoking the name of Jesus and saying they're acting in the way of Jesus. And some of the things that they're advocating are so far removed from the Jesus that we know and love. So far removed. One author wrote that Jesus comes not for the super spiritual, but for the wobbly and weak need who know that they don't have it all together, but they're not too proud to accept the handout of amazing grace. The author says there's something radically wrong when a church rejects someone who would be accepted by Jesus. We have to open our doors, folks. So becoming a Christian can be summed up in three words. It's a three-step program. Now, you've heard of a 12-step program, an eight-step program, all kinds of steps. But Coming a Christian is a three-step program. The first step is you have to admit, admit that you are a sinner in need of prayer. We do that here at the Teenage Church, and that's why every Sunday morning we begin our service with a prayer of confession because we know that we're all sinners. Secondly, you have to submit. And just like you go to the doctor and the doctor diagnoses your malady and writes you out a prescription, you have to submit to that prescription. You, if you don't do what he said, you might as well not go. And that's what Jesus is calling you to do. He's pointing out exactly what you need to do. You have to submit to his call to love one another and to his call to use your gifts in his service. So we got two so far. We got to admit, we got to submit. And the third and final one is that you have to commit. You have to commit to live your life each and every day, each and every day, in service of your Lord God in the manner that Jesus Christ would have you live. Now, friends, as we come to getting close to the end of our time this morning, I want to share with you a poem that I, I, I heard, and I, I won't tell you the whole story, but this poem I found in the book that my father gave me, and I, I don't want to get into that because if I start crying here this morning, I'm going to blow the whole thing. So I'm, I'm not going to go any farther than that. But the, the, the poem is entitled The Touch of the Master's Hand, and it's written by Myra Brooks Welsh. Please listen very, very carefully. It was better than Scott, and the auctioneer thought it was barely worth his while to waste much time on that old violin, but he held it up with a smile. One of my big good folks, he cried, who start the bidding for me? One dollar once, two dollars twice, two dollars, who make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, gone to three, but no. From the back of the room, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. He dusted off that old violin and tightened up her strings. And he played a melody so pure and sweet, like a caroling angel sings. Well, the music stopped, and the auctioneer, this time in a voice quiet and low, says, now what am I bid for this old violin? As he held it up with the bow. $1,000, $2,000, $2,000, $3,000, cried he. 3,000 once, 3,000 twice. 3,000 gone, cried he. The people cheered, but some of them cried, we don't quite understand what changed its worth. Swift came to reply. It was the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap to that thoughtless crowd, much like that old violin.
a mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he's almost gone. He's going once and going twice and almost gone. But then the master comes and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. My friends, as we come to the close of our time together this morning, let us go forth secure in the knowledge that we are lovers and followers of Jesus Christ and that we are called to let our lights so shine upon others that they might see our good works to the glory of our Father that they too will be influenced to becoming members of the family in Jesus so they too will know the unspeakable joy of a life that's been touched by the master's hand. Let all the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Our hymn this morning... Give me a minute here. No, first the, no, pardon me, the, the presentations of our tithes and offerings. This time, at this point, we, we have the uh, offertory and the presentations of our tithes and offerings. <laughs>
Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we bring our gifts to you, we are conscious that we have enough and to spare. Help us in all our giving to remember the needs of others and use the gifts that we bring so that those who do not know Jesus may hear the good news of his love and so receive the greatest blessing of all. Amen. Amen. Friends, we've come to the point of our service that we set aside every Sunday to have a little talk with Jesus as we pray together. We want to give special attention to the, our joys and concerns. Cletus Lewis, who Judy Miller's best friend, his, his brother, severely injured in a hit and run accident. As in prayers. We looked at for continued prayers for all those listed on our prayer list this morning, and for those who you know in your hearts that are standing in the need of prayer. And all who are dealing with crisis and turmoil in their lives. Friends, let us pray. Dear Father God, it, it saddens our hearts to see the great suffering of, of your beloved children in this world. We bring to mind all those in our locality who find themselves in a hard place. We especially pray for those who suffer physically with illness or mentally with depression or anxiety. Lord, come breathe on these people by your Holy Spirit and bring great love, hope, and joy through us, your church. Help us to minister to others in the strength of your spirit and to work in unity together. May we shine your glorious light into the darkness and remain steadfast and true to you. Father, it disturbs us when we see our world leaders embracing division instead of unity, pursuing wealth instead of justice, concealing lies instead of speaking out the truth. We lift all those in significant leadership to you, Father. Come guide their thoughts, cover their actions, renew their minds, protect them from the influence of the realms of darkness and sweep away any corruption. We pray that you would lay out new paths of righteousness in troubled nations and lands. Father, it's disturbing to see the difference in our world between the rich and the poor becoming wider. We lift all those in poverty to you, Lord. Come bring miracles of provision, healing, and restoration. Speak into our lives so that we might play our part in changing this world. These things we ask in the wonderful name of Jesus. And now let us pray together as our Savior taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is called as Partners in Christ's Service, Answering His Call. Number 343 in your Presbyterian hymnals, hymn 343, called as Partners in Christ's service. Let us come to our feet and sing joyously as we prepare to depart. <laughs>
Lord's let us prepare to go forth into the world, all of us being assigned to God's three-step program, ready to admit, ready to submit, and ready to commit to his will. The good news of the gospel is clear. God has saved us from our sin and saved us for a new life. Let us go forth in the knowledge of God's saving love that we might offer our lives as a continual thank offering, responding to what God has done. And as we go, may the love, grace, and fellowship of our triumph God abide with us and with those we love, both this day and forevermore. be seated for our postlude.
At this time, those of you at home or around the world, we invite you to unmute yourself and join together in Christian fellowship. Go in peace.